Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 67, Why is the Trinity Mainstream? I'm Mark Cain. Maybe you often wonder how the Trinity became the Christian norm. Why is it so common? There must be an obviously powerful conclusion to draw from this historically significant point, right? I've thought on this one for over 10 months now, having received the question last April. (laughs) Maybe I was hoping for the heavens to open and God to toss me golden frisbees upon which are inscribed the revelation of the meaning of church history. He did not. The UCA podcast is mainly for the Unitarian Christian community, that curious lot who find Scripture so compelling that they would face the scorn of the mainstream, and sometimes much worse than scorn. The UCA represents a loosely connected network of members, various groups, and ministries who are willing to connect and to help each other out so that together we might push back against all the trinsplaining, which passes for quality biblical instruction. Now, you may be a Trinitarian checking out the UCA, maybe doing some undercover reconnaissance. You've probably targeted a few of my episodes, like Episode 1, The Perilous Trinity Deep Dive, or 15, Why I'm Not a Trinitarian. You're looking for what we're about. If I may help, Hildy Chandler's interview, Episodes 2 through 4, would be a great introduction to the kind of process many of us have gone through to get here. But there's such a wealth of information out there for you. This podcast is mostly for Unitarian Christians who already went through the painful withdrawal process of rejection and anathemas, some being dismissed from fellowships they've loved and served with for a half century. It's a terribly troubling choice to make between your comfortable and loving church family and what you find in Scripture. As a Trinitarian, you may instinctively get that. I mean, if you knew right now, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that, in fact, the theory of the Trinity was not the teaching of the New Testament authors, would you speak up? Would you tell your spouse? Your pastor? Would you post your discovery on Facebook? If you are like most Trinitarians who actually do figure that out, you wouldn't do any of those things. Not at first. You'd be paralyzed with the reality that it may turn your world upside down, a world you likely have grown to appreciate and love. Seriously, think that through. This doctrine is unlike most teachings. It's been given the ultimate price tag. It reads... If you ask, you can't afford it. I believe this church teaching has done something sinister to the people in the pews. The church has duct-taped a brick to their back and sent them into the river to swim a race, all the while cheering them on and telling them how all true swimmers use bricks to make them stronger, to demonstrate their confidence, to build endurance, to set them apart from the other pitiful swimmers who don't have bricks. Those aren't even real swimmers, they cajole. Those brickless pretenders just want to swim their own way, to succumb to the strokes of their own heart's desires, not the tried and true, beloved and passed down strokes which proclaim the way of the duct-taped brick. Yes, sinister and wrong. I'll explain why after I answer the question today. Hey, Mark, this is Kristen from Ohio. Why do you think the Trinity is so mainstream? Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. There are several questions similar to this one, like, how could God let the church go wrong on this? Or, didn't God use the church to maintain this truth through the generations? Or, the ever-loved, how could millions of Christians be wrong? (laughs) They're all good questions. But I'm going to focus on the one question, why is it so mainstream? I think understanding that can help us be a bit more thoughtful about other questions, like questions that look to so many years of history or to large numbers of people as if those things carry some intrinsic proof of legitimacy. I mean, if you reword this question, how could millions of Christians be wrong, into something more like, Isn't something true if a majority of Christians say it's true? 
then you can see the problem. But again, I'm not going to answer that question. Maybe I'll just help you answer it yourself. So why? Why is it so mainstream? To be mainstream, it needs a lot of people who hold to it. Maybe not a majority, but enough that it's considered conventional, normal. In the case of the Trinity, it's taught, with varying degrees of success, by Catholics, Orthodox, Anglicans, and Protestants like Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, and on and on. It is a majority. And these groups make up the majority of the Christians. There's estimated to be over 2 billion Christians in the world. And just for comparison, Muslims are close with almost 2 billion. Hindus are about 1 billion, and Buddhists about half a billion. Non-religious people are around the same as Hindus, around 1 billion. And I don't know how they calculate all these numbers. I'm trusting the internet on this one. So, of the world population of almost 8 billion people, about 30% of them are Christians. So, if you randomly met people from across the planet, almost one in every three people would be a Trinitarian, or would say they are if you asked. That's pretty mainstream. Now, of all the Christians, not all of them are actually Trinitarian. The largest group of non-Trinitarians are, according to recent research, evangelicals. With about 600 million evangelicals in the world, and approximately 73% of them believing that Jesus was created by God, that makes 438 million. Mark. 438 Mark. million. What? That's not fair to count them. Uh, oh, come on. God created Jesus? You are taking advantage of the incomprehensibility of their doctrine and holding them to standards they don't even demand of themselves. E even if... And it's wrong to call them something they don't think they are. Okay, they just identify as Trinitarians. Uh, okay. All right, well, the next largest group of non-Trinitarians are the Jehovah's Witnesses at about 8 million people, and that's not even 1% of Christians. And the groups after them are significantly smaller. So I declare by virtue of not reaching even 1% of Jesus followers, we Unitarian Christians are not mainstream. Though if you count the evangelical... Mark. <sighs> so in this case, the Trinity is mainstream because it's so prevalent. It's on the books, as they say, of all the main Christian groups. How did we get here? Is it evidence of God's hand protecting and spreading this key doctrine through the ages? It certainly wasn't always mainstream. Starting in Acts, the earliest history of the advance of the faith, there was A, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, and B, his servant, Jesus, a man whom God appointed to judge the world. That's not Trinitarian speak. Then Christianity spread out to the Gentile world with new influences, new philosophies, and a decidedly less Jewish framework. The views on Jesus went through various forms. There were the adoptionists, the dynamic monarchians, the modalistic monarchians, the Logos Christology folks, it was a colorful time. There was no Trinitarian dogma standing as a mountain of truth against these other fly-by-night wannabes. The triune God was not there yet. It wasn't even there at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Seriously, check it out. It wasn't a tripersonal God yet. So, during those first centuries, there were a lot of theories that covered a whole range of things. And then, after hundreds of years, Christianity was blessed from on high with an emperor, Constantine, who moved Christianity from the outskirts into the palace. He institutionalized Christianity, making it a part of the political machinery of the time. 
he even enjoyed the honor of helping out in the Council of Nicaea. I mean, nothing says the hand of God at work like a Roman emperor's stamp of approval. Sarcasm. Finally, after enjoying the acceptance of the government for a time, Emperor Theodosius made Christianity the state religion in 380. Independent faith, conscience, and the freedom to disagree all fell to political power and expediency. The fusing of the state and faith did not bode well for the non-compliant dissenters over the coming years. Books were destroyed, people banished or killed, Thankfully, for the true Trinitarian doctrines, the What Would Jesus Do campaign was running about 1,610 years behind schedule. Uh, sarcasm's a bit harsh. Stay on point. So here's how the shift to mainstream happened. The Trinitarian model succeeded. It won. With the power of the state backing it, the voices of the opposition were labeled as heretics, irrational, defiant, and entirely lacking in God's spirit. Now, it's possible that you think I'm being too critical of church-state entanglement. I mean, maybe. Maybe despite the temptation to maintain power and influence, maybe the church-state machine remained objective in their desire for truth. Maybe. But history tells no such tale. The people in the empire fell in line and thus launched the mainstreaming of the Trinity it reached critical mass. The term critical mass comes from the science of physics. It's when there's enough fissionable material present to achieve a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. It continues on its own without external help. Here I'm using critical mass to refer to the sociological transition where there are enough people who believe and practice something that it becomes self-sustaining. And so we find each generation born in, raised in, and indoctrinated into the blessed and essential teaching of a Trinitarian Christianity. The culture of Christianity transitioned to be Trinitarian about 400 years after Christ. The teachings were enforced and critical mass was achieved. What makes Christian culture powerful and sticky and persistent is tradition. Culture already changes slowly, but with religion, you also get weekly reinforcing celebrations of the teachings and practices. I propose to you that the slowest culture to change is that of religion, and tradition is precisely the reason why. Just notice how some of the insignificant things we do in church have become tradition. The songs we sing, the style, hymns or choruses, the order of service, the steps done during a communion service. These minor traditions stick like gorilla glue, and they aren't even given the royal treatment. We don't praise our order of service each week from the pulpit. People of God, let us thank the dear Lord that, unlike the pagans, we take up our collection after the worship music but before the children are dismissed for junior church. <laughs> During membership classes, we don't review the theological accuracy and necessity of organ music for proper worship. We don't recite creeds to the usage of small wafers and tiny cups for communion. But try to suggest that your church update those practices. Go ahead, just try it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, count your blessings. If your church were to persist for another hundred years, they will likely still do many of the same things they do today. Now, what if a tradition isn't merely a recurring practice? What if that tradition is taught as having the complete and sustaining authority of all of Christendom? What if you are told that changing that tradition will eject you from God's mercy. What if changing that tradition will send you to hell? If the transition from organ music to including percussion took hundreds of years to accomplish, how long do you think it would take to change the linchpin of Christianity itself, the Trinity? 
maybe a millennia or two? Yeah, that's about right. In religion, a belief becomes mainstream and stays mainstream because religious practice embeds it into the very foundation of the faith culture. And there it persists until something powerful enough to dislodge it comes onto the scene. Just think back to the hundreds and hundreds of years when the common pew-sitters, the congregation, had no access to Scripture but could only hear what was taught by the political religious power structures from their pulpits. You can't change the carpet color without a fight in some churches. How would you mount a successful campaign against that? You don't. You believe what you're told, you go along because you don't know any better, and you've been convinced you have to in order to be right with God. You go along with the system and thus enjoy all the benefits of proper citizenship. And for fun, you might get to join in at a weekend event of tossing heretics' books into bonfires. Or, double star bonus, you may gather in the public square to watch a trinity-denying scoundrel burn slowly atop a pyre. The perks of going along are rather obvious. Why snub a good thing? Once a religious system reaches critical mass, it's likely to persist for a very, very, very long time. Presuming you are a Christ follower, explain how Islam persists generation after generation. Does Islam persist because it is true? Has it persisted because God is backing it to ensure its truth lives on through generations? It hit religious critical mass centuries ago and will likely still be practiced in 2123, a century from now, barring something massively disruptive happening. Or how about Hinduism? Yep, religious critical mass. It seems to me that the persistence of any practice or belief within a group that has hit the religious mainstream, that persistence has almost nothing to do with it being true. But now I'm starting to answer a different question. A question like, how could millions of Christians be wrong on the Trinity? So let's go back to becoming mainstream. If I may unpack the power of religious tradition a bit more, It isn't just the stickiness of practices, of the traditions. It's the cost of opposition. Unlike traditions of rituals, like church design, organ music, the Trinity has been equipped with a heavy-duty ankle monitor. You don't simply walk away or all the alarms sound. It's, you've rejected Jesus if you deny the Trinity, or You'll burn in hell if you deny the Trinity. Scary stuff. But it's not just the cost of losing your salvation. It's that if you walk away, you'll be jettisoned, rejected, and removed from your community. Promises of hellfire are scary for the future. Loss of community hurts right now. Community is one of the most basic and instinctual needs that we have. A human doesn't do particularly well trapped on an island alone. Wilson! (laughs) Nice. Large religious systems wield a terrifyingly sharp sword, the power of communal rejection. The pressure to not go against the group is immense. Even if threats of rejection are not spoken aloud, you instinctively know it to be true. Unspoken pressure to conform is one of the more subtle powers a group can have over its members. See, the feeling of belonging when you agree with and embrace the community, that feeling is, in a way, intoxicating. Cults know this and will artificially generate that embracing community culture. It's called love bombing. It's a way to jumpstart the system and accelerate rapidly into a community. And not a healthy community but one wherein you face a clear and unmistakable cost if you turn your back and walk out. Leaving a heavily communal religious movement can cost you nearly everything. So, denying the Trinity? That can cost you your role as an elder. 
It can cost you your Bible study friends. It may cost you your pastoral ministry, and you feed your family with that income. Remember Laureen Yandrup's talk about Jehovah's Witnesses? Episode 44 and 45. Or recently, Mike Collier's talk about the Mormon faith? Episode 62, 63, and 65. These movements have hit their own critical mass, and they self-perpetuate. There's a clear cost to leaving, and especially when everyone around you remains a part of the group. It's why many stay in, even when they are out. PIMO, P-I-M-O, physically in, but mentally out. The pressure to stay in because of community is so high, they've got a term and an acronym for it, PIMO. And to make this a well-rounded episode, let's put some historical teeth into the claim that A, the church became political and powerful, and B, there was a cost for dissent. Dan Gill, Episode 7, On Oneness and Wrongness, has a short article on his website, 21st Century Reformation, called Forced Trinitarian Orthodoxy Prevails. He describes the pressure that came upon the church by emperors demanding unity, and how, quote, the price of peace for Christians was the loss of control over what they would believe and practice, end quote. Well said. Dan shares this nugget regarding an edict, the Theodosian Code, that went into effect in 439, which most assuredly brought great joy to God for the unity it created. Sarcasm. Unity for those who were Trinitarian. But then it adds, The rest, however, whom we adjudge demented and insane, shall sustain the infamy of heretical dogmas. Their meeting places shall not be called churches, and they shall be smitten primarily by divine vengeance, and secondly, by the punishment of our power, which we have received by divine favor. Ooh, that's getting your mainstream on right there. Don't beat around the bush. The state and the church were joined together, and for centuries, the power of the state threatened, suppressed, banished, imprisoned, beat, killed, shut down, and bureaucratized those who wouldn't conform. Uh, bureaucratized? Uh, oh, uh, governed with red tape, or the Middle Ages equivalent of red tape. I, I don't know. Uh, groups would need to get permission from the church state in order to exist. Even the arrival of the Protestant Reformation didn't correct this. The power of the church persisted, and even the Protestants continued to operate with a heavy hand. But I'm not a historian. You know what you'd probably appreciate? A concise and enjoyable presentation of church history that's not beholden to the Trinitarian narrative. I've been thoroughly enjoying Sean Finnegan's presentation through Living Hope International Ministries called Early Church History. There's a link to the video playlist in the show notes. Sean is also editing the audio and releasing them on the Restitutio podcast. I appreciate this series because it's like the content of a history college class, but with the heart and delivery from someone who understands his audience and is having more fun than normal people would have. <laughs> it's a bit like story time, with guest appearances from Josephus, Tortullian, Augustine, and more. Thank you, Sean, and LHIM for making this available. So why is the Trinity so mainstream? Well, Kristen, I believe it's because the humble servant faith of the Jewish Messiah, where the least shall be the greatest, was spoiled and displaced. The organic, homegrown faith farms were driven out by the religious industrial complex. The Rabbi Jesus taught a simple monotheistic faith where there was one God, his Father. He taught a faith that could be tested by its fruit, you know, care for others, love, and doing good to the least of those among us. The industry that took over, well, it certainly ramped up the quantity of religious production. There were huge mass uh, conversions, if you could call them that. People became Christians because that was preferred by the emperor and you got to live peacefully within the Roman Empire. But the faith biodiversity of the early centuries was decimated, plowed under and sprayed with millions of gallons of if-you-know-what's-best-aside. 
judging strictly by the fruit, something went awry. I won't say that everything about this transformation was bad. The scriptures were read in the churches. People did persist in doing good, sometimes despite the organized church. Vast numbers of people were exposed to scripture. Christianity did become mainstream. But I know it would have survived even without the empire's help, because Jesus promised it would. He promised he would build his church. The early church thrived because of its impact on people. The transformative power of a Messiah who went to the cross on our behalf and whose trust and obedience was vindicated by God's raising him to immortal life. It was the message of hope to a broken world that captured the masses. It didn't promise political favor or peace through conformity. It offered life. Maybe Christianity would have remained a much smaller movement without Constantine's help. I mean, Jesus didn't exactly promise that when he returns, he'd find billions of faithful followers. But history is what it is. The Trinity became a key part of the mainstream. It hit critical mass under the brutal pressure of the empire, and the nuclear reaction could not be stopped. And to many students of Scripture, who would not go gentle into that good night, it became Chernobyl. So, why would I describe the way of the duct-taped brick, the teachings of the Trinity, to be sinister and wrong? It's not because the people who teach it are sinister. It's what this type of teaching demands of its students. And these demands are made by pastors, apologists, and especially seminaries. By making the Trinity essential, the spiritual authorities are conditioning people to accept concepts which are outside of Scripture as critical beliefs. They are conditioned to not only tolerate, but fully embrace explanations that are unlike anything written in the New Testament. Now, it isn't announced that way, not directly, but that's what it is. If you are a Trinitarian who stayed with me to this point, you may be especially displeased with me here, but I'm not putting words in your leader's mouths. I'm not straw-manning this. The Trinity is a doctrine of inferences, of axioms and ideas looped together in such a way that the solution to the tangled knot of concepts is a theorized three-in-one kind of being. The solution then demands extra-biblical theories about a dual-natured Jesus. That's all inference. Here, if you've read a lot of scriptures, keep them in your mind as you listen to what I'll play next. Think about the debates and challenges in the book of Acts. Think about Paul's in-depth theological writings like in Romans. Okay, got those in mind? See if this sounds any different. This is a question on the Trinity, really. How can you have a Trinity and how can the Trinity be God? There's no perfect illustration of a trinity, Conan, but this is maybe close. Just because you can't completely comprehend it doesn't mean you can't apprehend it. Same thing is true here. You've got a triangle, and it has three corners. And in each corner, you have a person of the trinity, a father, a son, and a holy spirit. And they share one divine nature. This is infinite. But Jesus has a finite nature, a human nature, that is connected with the divine nature but doesn't intermingle with it. So whenever you ask a question about Jesus, you always have to ask two questions. Did Jesus get hungry? As God, no. As man, yes. You can also look at it this way. That God has one what and three who's, but Jesus has two what's and one who. So whenever you ask a question about what, who two, you've got to ask which what are you talking about? Are you talking about what one or what two? But... The issue here is, is that you can have a divine nature and you can have three persons in that divine nature. But remember, this person over here is finite. This, I should say, this nature over here is finite. This person, the son, has an infinite nature, a divine nature, and a human nature. That's Frank Turek, an apologist who, in this case, was transplaining to a questioning student. So, did you keep scripture in mind? 
Who did he sound most like? Was it Philip in the talk with the eunuch? Or maybe Turk here reminded you of the songs of the angels in Revelation. Maybe it harkened you back to the time Jesus opened up the meaning of scriptures to the men on the road to Emmaus. Maybe. Or, it's speculation and inference, boldly proclaimed as incontrovertible truth. So, students are taught that inferences can be essential. They are taught that not understanding something is almost a bonus. It's super spiritual. You wouldn't expect to understand an infinite God. Then they are taught that they should be suspicious of other Christians if they don't agree on their set of speculations. Worse, they are encouraged to avoid and even condemn them. Toxic stuff. A faith should not be configured this way. It's like the seminaries inject this cancerous approach right from the start. In the theology of God category, it's the underlying premise. The mental violation that takes place leaves the students with a subtle but unavoidable scar. There are areas now that you don't want to question. There are requirements that you really don't understand. There are apparent contradictions that we must brush past because we've been told to. There are people that we must reject. When it comes to the central element of our faith, who our God is, these students become apologists of tradition. Maybe this will be the generation where it ends. But critical mass, it won't be a walk in the park. Last Sunday, millions of dollars were spent on the He Gets Us campaign advertising during the Super Bowl, trying to make Jesus interesting and relatable to a more modern and skeptical crowd. The premise is that Jesus, being fully man, gets us, except that mainstream Christianity also has him as fully God. They didn't try to explain that. I mean, they were trying to get people interested, not confuse them with legacy theological constructs. I understand why they would leave that out. Several of the UCA board jumped into the fray and produced a set of alternate videos, ones that might clarify what he gets us could actually mean. Recently, a generous donor wanted to see us get out in front of some YouTube viewers, and so we are. These clarifying and challenging alternate videos will be gracing the eyeballs of thousands of viewers. What will result? Not sure. But when everyone is talking about Jesus, that's a good thing. I hope to have a brief discussion in the coming weeks about what came of that effort. I suspect it'll be interesting. Here's a segment from one of the videos. And we all know fear. So did Jesus, facing the horror of his imminent arrest and execution. Always. In sadness and in fear, Jesus obeyed and trusted God. Jesus gets us because he's one of us and lived a life dependent on God for joy and hope. That's Brandon Duke. If you are like me and worked on a podcast, unaware that the Super Bowl was even taking place, then you may not know what this is all about. There are two links in the show notes, the He Gets Us campaign and the Unitarian Christian Alliance YouTube channel where our alternatives are listed. You can go check those out and catch up. Now from the mailbag, here's a note from a new UCA member, Ali, in Australia. Hi, Mark. I just signed up for your podcast newsletter, and I look forward to listening to some of the podcasts. I'm new to the world of podcasts, but lately I discovered and have been listening to some on Restitutio. I just finished the One God series, which I loved. Then the interview with Jeff Dibel about his book, Christ Before Creeds, caught my eye. I've been looking for a book to be able to give to others to read, and I think this is it. The author and pastor lives about four hours' drive from me. I really identify with so many of his thoughts. So with that, and meeting you, 
I'm starting to feel a little less alone. Thanks again, and I look forward to the podcast. Warm regards, Ali. Thanks, Ali. Yes, I've heard the same about Jeff Dibel's book, that it's pretty approachable for folks not yet warmed up to the idea that something may be off in mainstream Christianity. I do hope you enjoy the over 60 past episodes of this podcast. If you aren't planning to binge listen to them all, allow me to provide a personalized hand selection for you. Episode number one, naturally, I always recommend the Perilous Trinity Deep Dive. It's the foundation episode of the whole podcast. And Hildy as well, episodes two through four. Then how about Wandering, Arguing, and Culture with Anne Fishhopper, episode 25? And then you can get to know me more through one of my own past experiences, episode 46, Towering Over Me. Or... Naturally, you can just work your way through them all sequentially as you wash dishes, mow the lawn, it is summer there, I believe, or while you're out on a crocodile-watching trip, if those are a thing. Thanks, Ali. It's great to meet you, and you are not alone. If you want to share, the mailbag is open. Write podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. The UCA website has a list of events which welcome the broader UCA community to attend. If you have just such an event, and it isn't listed, instructions are there for how to get that done. Amanda Dunn, guest on episode 33 and 34, is our event coordinator, and she'll be glad to assist you. In March, there are events in New York and Indiana. In April, there are events in New York and Tennessee, and an Israel trip, which may be nearly full by now, but it doesn't hurt to check. In July, we have Fuel in Indiana, the event for the older youth and where I met the three quizzers that I interviewed on episode 59. And also in July is an event in the state of Oregon. Oh, back to April. There is one more item to mention. During the last UCA conference, one of the groups in Texas was interested in having a UCA type of conference. We are only now finishing what a regional UCA conference would be, In the meantime, that group scheduled their annual meeting for Texas churches and other friends in the area, and they are inviting several presenters to come, including Kermit Zarley, the professional golfer, and Keegan Chandler, who is on the UCA board. And I'll be attending, too. I'm going to be sharing our vision for regional UCA events. This is an opportunity for the people in Texas to consider what they could do in the coming years, how they might serve the broader Unitarian Christian community should be a great discussion. That's April 21 through 23 in Gatesville, Texas. All of these events are listed on the UCA events page, unitarianchristianalliance.org forward slash events. A reminder that more of the 2022 UCA presentation videos have been released. They're coming out each Friday in the order that they were presented. Since the previous podcast episode, we've added Bill Schlegel's presentation Do Micah 5 and Matthew 2 Declare the Eternal Deity of Messiah? And Anna Brown's Nothing Mirror About a Man in the Image of God. Oh, Ali, if you'd like to meet these folks, Bill was a guest here on episode 41, and Anna was my guest way back in episode 6. With the flurry of activity around our own He Gets Us campaign, the official announcement for papers for this coming conference, it was delayed. But if you're putting one together... Just continue on. We'll let you know soon. Perhaps this podcast was helpful for you. I suspect it's not something you'd share with a Trinitarian friend, but people have surprised me. It's more of a help for thinking through what we regularly have to deal with. You know, the sheer quantities of people who are Trinitarian. If you know of others, maybe folks you regularly talk with about this kind of thing, and they might benefit too, please share and help get more people involved. The winds have changed direction, and it's exciting to be seeing it happen, to be there, to be a part of it. I'm especially excited about the 438 million evangelicals who may soon realize that instead of being bemoaned for seeing Jesus as someone other than God, they could be encouraged and discover the joy of reading Scripture afresh without having to wear the obscuring, Mystery glasses. Kristen, thanks for reaching out, by audio no less, and thanks for waiting 10 months. 
Based on a few other notes I've received, I may be coming back to some of the related questions in future episodes. These are excellent questions, and ones that deserve to be carefully considered. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well.